Hey everyone, thanks again for joining up with me tonight for another round of WOW Live Word on Wednesdays Live. I hope you uh, can put up with my voice. Got a little bit of a cold trying to get in there today and uh, sort of taken over my nasal passages, so I sound a little funny. Um, and I may have to take a break every once in a while, silence the microphone and take care of things and then get back to you depending on how it goes. But just keep me in prayer as we go through and we'll get through hopefully in a good order. I want to begin tonight with a quick synopsis of some of the key things that we've considered together about dinosaurs in the Bible. I want to make a special emphasis on reviewing information supporting the idea that dinosaurs and humans existed together to look at evidence that we've seen already, but then I'm going to move into information that I haven't yet presented to you, some evidence from other areas that will show forth uh, uh, evidence for the coexistence of men and dinosaurs. Keep in mind that we have been told over and over again, the idea, and the idea has been constantly reinforced through the media, through the culture, and schools, and all kinds of ways, that dinosaurs first arose around 300 million years ago, and they died out 65 million years ago. These are the kinds of things we have been told pretty much all our lives from all kinds of sources. And if you believe anything other than that, you feel, you're left to feel somewhat out of the loop, idiotic, stupid, whatever. All kinds of things can happen to, 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 to your feelings and your emotions in this. At ki as kids, though, we were taught things like, you know, dinosaurs once ruled the earth. That's the big banner on Jurassic Park, right? You see it here. But I, I sort of see what this is. This is a model of a dinosaur. It's, well, it's not a real dinosaur, you know. We're supposed to be struck with awe with this idea of dinosaurs when dinosaurs ruled the earth. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, wow, that was that must have been something. Hey kids, Jurassic Park, it was just a movie, all right? Good movie, great special effects. Somebody's idea of what dinosaurs were like. Because basically, no one in our culture today has ever seen a dinosaur, all right? Hardly anyone. There may be somebody out there who's seen something pretty weird. But most people, not seeing dinosaurs out there. Godzilla was a movie, right? Somebody's idea of what a giant uh, nuclear-powered wizard <laughs> lizard would be, right? Not a, not a real thing, but it's somebody's great idea. A guy dressed up in a suit, especially the old Godzilla movies, a kind of a rubbery suit and banged around on, on a, a model city and busted it all up. He must have had more fun than anybody. And then King Kong, great movie, King Kong. But just an idea, all right? And, and that's the important thing to keep in mind with all of the cultural things we have seen in books and movies and have been told this and that and the other thing. It's people's ideas about what has happened. There's probably some truth to some of it, but you just have to take things with a grain of salt always. Just remember that candle experiment that we've talked about several times. We've only been in the room for a while. The candle was burning when we walked in. We have no idea how long it's been burning. Remember what we've discussed about the idea of a vast age for the earth and how it's all based upon assumption. It cannot be demonstrated conclusively by direct observation that the earth is four and a half billion years old. That's just not possible. It can't be demonstrated conclusively that life first arose from non-life a billion years ago. And how does that even happen? How does life ever come from non-life? All observational science, things that people have been able to see and observe time after time after time after time, tell us that life must come from life. There's no such thing as the fancy word abiogenesis, life coming from non-life. That doesn't happen. And that the earliest ecosystems, it can't be com completely demonstrated or conclusively demonstrated that the earliest ecosystems supposedly emerged half a billion years ago. No, you just cannot do that. Evolutionists, they play with time in the way, same way that Congress plays with our money. Okay, It's the same thing. 
So let's look at evidence for dinosaurs and humans coexisting. In our first session on dinosaurs, I noted that the word dinosaur isn't found in the Bible. And so with that fact in mind, some people will then uh, take that fact and make it part of their reasoning to claim that the Bible is not an accurate record of history on our planet because the Bible doesn't talk about dinosaurs. I saw a post just uh, a half an hour or so before uh, I got uh, this together tonight, and somebody in a, in a Facebook group said, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about dinosaurs. But, you know, we've talked about this, all right? Uh, I, I pointed out that the, the word dragon is in the Bible. It's found in the King James Version of the Bible numerous times. There's the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance page showing how often the word dragon is found in, in the King James Version. It's a total of 35 times, in fact. And you can see there's not much imagination needed to see the similarities between dinosaurs and what dragons supposedly look like, right? You know, if an Englishman living 500 years ago happened to walk into a movie theater today out of some strange fluke, and they happened to be showing Jurassic Park, undoubtedly he would describe what he was seeing in the closest word he had in his own vocabulary. Why, they be dragons, you know dragons, right? That's what they'd say. But besides this, we did look at a Bible passage which describes what sounds like a dinosaur. It's found in Job 40, and it doesn't use the word dragon. Sorry, Sir Francis Bacon, dragon's not it. It uses the word behemoth. Job 40, verses 15 to 19. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar, a great big pine tree, right? And the sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. This is a massive thing. He is the first of the ways of God, the biggest thing God ever made. The word behemoth is an untranslatable Hebrew word. No one really knows for sure what it means. That's intriguing enough right there. We use the word behemoth today to describe something that's very huge. We got the word behemoth from Job chapter 40, this very passage we're looking at. Behemoth is the actual Hebrew word transliterated or spelled out phonetically into English, taking our letters and looking at the letters of the Hebrew word and making connection between them. Excuse me for one moment. One of those times is coming up here. Now, some might say that the word behemoth might be referring to an elephant or a hippopotamus, but Hebrew has words for both of those animals. There's Hebrew, a Hebrew word for elephant, one for hippopotamus, uh, and, and either one of those words would have been used if that's what God was talking about here. But he uses behemoth, a word that apparently Job knew, but nobody else seems to know. Besides, as we'll see, the description here in Job 40 doesn't really fit an elephant or a hippo, ultimately. We know that Job could see the behemoth because God told him to look at it. Job says, or God says, Job, hey, I made the behemoth right along with you. That means behemoths and people were made at the same time and they lived together. The behemoth was a plant eater, eating grass like an ox. Well, elephants and hippos also eat plants and eat grass as an ox might. Well, God says that the behemoth has strong and powerful hips and also a powerful stomach. The same thing could be said of elephants and hippos. But then God says that the behemoth has a tail like a cedar tree. Now, neither elephants nor hippos have tails that are like cedar trees. They got little tiny weenie trees, bushes or something coming off of there, just little stalks. However, the largest land animals to have ever lived were the sauropod dinosaurs. The Mementosaurus, the Apatosaurus, the Diplodocus, and the Camarasaurus. And they all had tails like big cedar trees. 
And God said the behemoth was the very first of the ways of God, the chief of the ways of God, the biggest animal that he had ever made. Well, it really sounds to me like behemoth could have been a huge sauropod dinosaur. This is why nobody knows what the word means anymore. There are no examples to point to. But Job, hey, he could see it. And then we looked at evidence suggesting that others in ancient history have also seen dinosaurs in their days. For example, we looked at this border, a decorative border surrounding an entryway, which is part of the ancient Angkor Wat temple in Cambodia. The Angkor Wat temple was built in the early 12th century AD. And notice the image just to the right of Dr. Don Patton's head there. Got that yellow arrow pointing to it. It looks strangely like an image of a stegosaur, the dinosaur with those big bony plates sticking up out of its back. Here's a closer look at the Angkor Wat stegosaur. It certainly looks like the stegosaurus that we see in museums and in images that are made today. The Angkor Wat temple was built in the early 1100s. Did somebody see a stegosaurus and car carve its image into the temple? I I've seen, uh, I heard people say that, well, this is not uh, uh, bony plates on the back of this particular creature on the temple there. What you're really seeing is some kind of unknown animal, well, standing in front of some kind of a bush or tree or something that has those things coming out. Oh, and they just happen to arch in the shape of the back and go up and down right along with the back. I, I could just as easily say, well, see, there's a huge baseball mitt standing right behind there and, and, and the catcher's mitt or something. Well, it's not the catcher's mitt. It's got the individual. It's a baseball glove sitting up there and he's standing in front of it. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. No, it's obvious that those, those structures up there atop that animal are on top of the animal, okay? Now, you can't really see it in this photo, but there's an image here that's been scratched into this stony surface on the Kachina Bridge at Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah. In the next slide, I put a circle around it to help you focus a little bit. That might help you see it, uh, and uh, it doesn't necessarily make it easier to see, but if you focus in on there, you might be able to see a long neck and a tail coming off the back end of it. But on this slide, just to help you out, this is the image highlighted for you. You can now see clearly how this looks for all the world like the image of a sauropod dinosaur. Did some Native American from long ago or somebody else that lived in the area see this animal and then recreate it on this stone surface? Absolutely fascinating stuff. Here is a vase from Peru uh, dated at over 2,000 years. 2,000 years old. goes back to the time of Christ. The creature is wrapped around the clay pot. Who saw this creature? Who recreated it on this pottery artifact? Maybe the history of dinosaurs is much different than what we've been taught by the prevailing idea today. This is a current idea. It's only been out for, well, since 1841, roughly around that time. That's all the longer we've been kicking this idea around. It doesn't mean that we're right. In the background of this slide, you can see a portion of a mosaic known as the Nile Mosaic of Palestrina. It dates back to about 100 BC, 100 years before Christ. Wikipedia describes it. The Nile Mosaic of Palestrina is a late Hellenistic floor mosaic depicting the Nile River in its passage from Ethiopia to the Mediterranean. The mosaic was part of a classical sanctuary grotto in Palestrina, a town east of Rome in central Italy. Of interest to us is that larger image that I have in the, in the foreground, a, 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 a sectional part, you know, just a little call out, so to speak. Several Egyptians are depicted on that picture fighting a creature that's coming up out of the river, out of the Nile. And the word shown above the scene is a Greek word there, crocodilopardalis. That's a, that's a, that's a supercalifragilistic something or other. Crocodilopardalis that, that roughly translates into a crocodile leopard. So it's like a, a combination of words to describe what this thing is. Here's an artistic enhancement of the image. So you can see the crocodile leopard a little bit better. 
doesn't look like any animal that we know of today, but it does certainly look like a dinosaur. Now here's something that I haven't shared with you yet. We're moving into new information now. This is the Carlisle Cathedral in Cumbria in northern England. The cathedral, as we see it today, was pretty much completed around the year 1400, or by the year 1400. There's some additional things done afterwards, but basically uh, 1400. The cathedral was first established there as a church back in 1123. Here is an inside view of the Carlisle Cathedral in England. A beautiful place. Wouldn't it be awesome to go and see that uh, today? Uh, you'll notice there the piece of blue carpet right in the middle of the choir loft. The choir uh, had uh, choir lofts, I guess you could say. There's one on either side of the sanctuary there. Uh, beneath that carpet, that blue carpet there in the center, is the marble tomb of Bishop Bell. Bishop Bell died in 1496. And one of the finest examples of medieval brasswork surrounds that tomb and goes along the edges there. To appreciate the details a little bit closer, here's a 1794 artist's sketch of the Bell Tomb brasswork to get you an idea of what it actually uh, is represented there or one, at one time was. Now you can understand, looking at the one on the left, why some people thought it best to cover up the tomb with that blue carpet in order to preserve what remained of the work. Lots of choirs had gone trudging over that over the centuries, and it got wore down. Now here are four brass etchings from the bell tomb. You can see common animals there. These animals appear between the words along the uh, edging of that uh, tomb, that uh, border around it. And you can see common animals here. You can see a dog, a fish, a bird, and an eel. Animals that these people would have seen on a regular basis. The eel, maybe not as often, but nonetheless, they were fisher, fishermen there. They were close to the coast, actually, so an eel would have been, a, been an obvious choice to, to have put on this. But then there's this image. Something obviously uncommon. You'll have to forgive me for a moment yet again. Sorry about this, but I won't. Okay, that gave you a chance to look at that a little closer. There's two creatures facing one another, and their long necks are intertwined. Some say that these are mythical beasts. That doesn't really seem likely. The other animals we saw depicted, the dog, the fish, the bird, and eel, they are animals the local population would have regularly seen. The supposition would be they saw these animals as well. Maybe not as often as the eel, but they saw them. Here's a sketch to make the uh, uh, animals much clearer for you to see. Uh, these look for all the world like long-necked sauropod dinosaurs. In the lower right corner, is an artist's depiction of a Spinophorosaurus. Uh, Spinophorus. <laughs> I, I, I've worked on pronouncing this. It's S P I N O P H O R O Saurus. So Spinophorosaurus. I think that's probably right. Spinophorosaurus. Uh, you can see some spikes on the end of Spiny's tail there, uh, very similar to the end of the tail on the left hand creature on the bell tomb brassworks. You can. So. You know, it really looks a lot like that particular creature. Very, very interesting. Did people in 14th century England see dinosaurs somewhere? Certainly looks possible to me. There's a chronicle uh, dated 1405 from England, right around the time of the completion of that cathedral. And in that chronicle, it relates the following story. Close to the town of Bury's, near Sudbury, there has lately appeared, to the great hurt of the countryside, a dragon, vast in body, with a crested head, teeth like a saw, and a tail extending to an enormous length. Having slaughtered the shepherd of a flock, it devoured many sheep. Now there's an etching depicting a very similar event that comes from Polish legends. Uh, the the Wawel 
Dragon, W-A-W-E-L, or the Dragon of Wawel Hill. The older legends from the 14th century say that the Wawel Dragon made its appearance during the ring of King Krak, K-R-A-K, kind of like Krakow in Poland, okay? Uh, the, the dragon required weekly offerings of cattle, or the dragon would start to eat citizens of Wawel. That was the arrangement. You know, you give me cattle or I eat you. Two of King Croc's sons tricked the dragon to eat a cow skin stuffed with smoldering sulfur, which killed the beast. Not too different, actually, from a legend of Alexander the Great's time when he killed a, a dragon with some kind of similar trick. I don't know if it's a common way to kill dragons or if there's borrowing on the legend or whatever. Who knows? And in China, there's another example of carved dinosaurs. These are the ones that get me because these, these things are carved and they look so close to what we see as dinosaurs today. This was found on an ancient wine vessel that was discovered in the 1970s. At the Creation Ministries website, creation.com, which is a good place to check out, an article describes this fascinating piece of art. Dinosaurs supposedly died out 66 million years ago, leaving only their remains. And humans are supposed to have only come on the scene tens of millions of years later. That's the story, right? However, there are man-made representations of dinosaurs, drawings, carvings, and the like, known from every continent except Antarctica. And maybe there's some there, we just haven't got through the ice. That's my little addendum there. A late Eastern Zhao, 3rd century BC wine vessel, excavated in 1975 from a tomb in Sanmen Xia, the Henan province in China, demonstrates this beautifully. Cast in bronze with much of its gold inlay still preserved, the stunning artistry is clear. Looking distinctly dinosaurian are four animals, one featured on each side of the wine vessel, easily recognizable as sauropod dinosaurs. Due to the particularly rounded head at the end of the long, thin neck peering over the edge, it may very well be depicting a Camarasaurus. The thick, muscular legs come down from the body and the tail extends outward suspended in the air not touching the sides of the vessel it is currently on display at the henan provincial museum in china interestingly the earliest chi in the earliest chinese book on the wine vessel the animals are described as being quote in the shape of a dragon, end quote. And if dragon was, of course, the word used to describe a range of dinosaur-type animals before the more modern word dinosaur was coined by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. So as I told you in a previous lesson, the concept of the dragon is universal. People from every continent on Earth, except in Antarctica, have dinosaur-like animals in their art and culture. And we call them dragons. There are more dragon legends from around the world than just the few that we have looked at in this series of lessons. And we could even see more interesting examples of dinosaur art coming from people who lived well before Sir Richard Owen invented the word dinosaur. For instance, here's a very curious item found in Bernifal Cave, Bernifal, maybe it's Bernifal Cave in France, it's one of the caverns renowned for the Neanderthal cave paintings. And that's kind of what we're looking at here, uh, kind of a remaining aspect of a, of, a, of a painting. This photo that you see was taken by Dr. Jack Cuozzo, who has written a very fascinating book on the Neanderthals, which is entitled Buried Alive. You ever get a chance to look for Cuozzo? It's C-U, I don't know if I'm saying it or not, Cuozzo. It's C-U-O-Z-Z-O, Jack Cuazzo, and the title's Buried Alive. It's a, it's a neat book on Neanderthals and his views on that. And this photo is found in, in his book. I've circled the area where this image appears, and it's probably hard for you to see too much there, but it shows what looks all the world like a, a two-legged, short-armed dinosaur on the left-hand side of that oval, going head-to-head -head right about the middle of the oval, with a woolly mammoth who's to the right side of the oval. Bear in mind that dinosaurs supposedly died out long before mammoths showed up. That's the story we get today. 
Yeah, but since it's hard to see, I got a sketch that I found which shows what appears inside that red oval. Did an ancient cave-dwelling person, also a cave painter, observe a fight between a dinosaur and a mammoth? If you saw something like that, wouldn't you remember it? Wouldn't you wish you could take a picture? Wouldn't you hope you'd have your cell phone there and it's fully charged? Don't interpret this by what you have been told you can see and what you've also been told that you can't see. Just take it at face value for what it is. What happened here? How did this get recorded for all of time? And then there's this jade piece from the Shang Dynasty of ancient China. The Shang Dynasty was contemporaneous with the period of time that ran from the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt until about the time David was king in Israel. And somewhere within that time period, a Chinese artisan carved this very dinosaur-looking dragon out of the beautiful jade. This has all been very intriguing, all that we've seen. If these kinds of things like dragon legends and ancient art depicting dinosaurs, if that was all that we had to go on, and there's more we could, could look at, I can promise you that, it would be enough to make a decent case for humans and dinosaurs coexisting. Somebody had to see these things to record them this way. But there's even more evidence than this. I own a DVD that's simply called Jurassic. Uh, it's not Jurassic Park, okay, it's just Jurassic. And it was produced by a man by the name of Trey Smith, and also with uh, production help from Bob Enyart. Trey, I like him. He has a very engaging way of presenting Bible truth. Uh, it's different than what other people do, and that's what makes it kind of neat. And <clears throat> putting together evidence supporting the accounts found in the Bible. And in this DVD, he says dinosaurs were young. All of them. All of them were young. We don't have millions of years old dinosaurs, he says. Geologist Dave Nutting appears at the beginning of Trey Smith's documentary. And as it says on their website, Dave's website and his wife Mary Jo, they are founders and directors of the Alpha Omega Institute. They were college math and science instructors uh, when they first grappled with the problems of evolution and became convinced of the evidence for creation. Their personal contact with students convinced them of the importance of the issue, not only in science, but in evangelism and Christian growth. Since founding uh, the Alpha Omega Institute in 1984, they have spoken extensively, giving presentations for churches, universities, camps, and tours, both in the USA and internationally. So, in the Jurassic documentary here, Dave is asked, what does a decomposing dinosaur smell like? Here's his answer. When I was a youngster, about 13, 14, 15, all the way through there, I used to be able to cut and polish a huge amount of dinosaur bones. And as I was cutting this dinosaur bone, making jewelry, making polished specimens, etc., once in a while, I would actually be grinding into this material and I would smell this horrible, rotten egg smell. So what does the decomposing dinosaur smell like? Rotten eggs. Kind of like a lot of things decomposing. Now, wait just a minute, Dave. Dinosaur bones are at least 65 million years old, aren't they? And maybe as much as 225 million years old, right? There isn't supposed to be any kind of biological material left in these fossilized bones. I mean, you can't have anything giving off an odor. It's all gone, Dave. I mean, Dave, you may be a great guy and all, but there's no way you could have smelled a decomposing dinosaur. Could you? Well, it is true that the shelf life, if you will, of biological material isn't very long. Paleontologist Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who's worked with dinosaur fossils since the late 80s, said this, Everyone knows how soft tissues degrade. If you take a blood sample and you stick it on a shelf, you have nothing recognizable in about a week. So why would there be anything left in dinosaurs? 
But Dr. Schweitzer, like Dave Nutting, has also experienced some bad odors emanating from some of the dinosaur bones that she's worked with. Now, not necessarily dinosaur bad breath like I've tried to depict here. Mary Schweitzer, now a renowned paleontologist in her own right, had done some work with Dr. Jack Horner, who is one of the world's foremost dinosaur experts. In fact, he was the uh, was a consult was the consultant on dinosaurs for the uh, movie Jurassic Park, and also he the uh, character the main character Dr. Grant in that movie. Uh, was based upon uh, Jack Horner, okay? Now, Jack and, and Mary Schweitzer, uh, Jack Horner and Mary Schweitzer, they had been working on some bones from the Hell Creek Formation in the state of Montana. Lots of dinosaur bones happened to be buried there. Maybe that's why it's got the name that it does. And Dr. Schweitzer related a, an experience that she'd had. Once when she was working with a T-Rex skeleton harvested from Hell Creek, she noticed that the fossil exuded a distinctly organic odor. She said, it smelled just like one of the cadavers we had in the lab, who'd been treated with chemotherapy before he died, she says. Given the conventional wisdom that such fossils were made up entirely of minerals, Schweitzer was anxious when mentioning this to Horner. But he said, oh yeah, all Hell Creek bones smell. She says, to most old line paleontologists, the smell of death didn't even register. To Schweitzer, it meant that traces of life might still cling to those bones. I like how the writer of this Discover Magazine article says that most old line paleontologists didn't even register the smell of death when they were working with these bones. Horner, one of the old line grave diggers, simply said, yeah, all the bones from Hell Creek smell bad. Schweitzer smelled decay, and she recognized it as decay, and she had the insight about tissue still being present inside those bones that's contributing to the smell. Now, I do want you to understand that although Schweitzer is an, an evangelical and uh, says she's a Christian, she's by no means a young earth creationist, okay? She is an evolutionist, specifically an atheistic evolutionist, believing that God used evolution to create life. And we talked about that in a previous lesson, that, that idea. Still, what happened next to her was quite amazing. The April 26, 2006 article in Discover Magazine tells the story this way. The second surprise hit in January 2004. While Schweitzer was attending a departmental taco party, laboratory assistant Jennifer Whitmire raced breathlessly into the room. You aren't going to believe what happened, the lab assistant sputtered. Whitmire had been pulling the late shift, analyzing pieces from the T-Rex limb. She had just soaked a fragment of medullary bone in dilute acid to remove some calcium phosphate. This was an unusual procedure to carry out in a dinosaur lab. Scientists typically assume that a fossilized dinosaur consists of rock that would entirely dissolve in acid. See, what they, they believe, I probably should say something about this, when something fossilizes, like a dinosaur bone, excuse me, when something fossilizes, like a dinosaur bone, the, the mineral actually soaks into the cells of the bone and, and uh, it uh, petrifies it, basically. It replaces that, that uh, cellular material uh, and so forth, bone material, osteocytes, the, the, the bone cells, replaces them with mineral material. So you aren't really looking at the rock. You're looking at a, an impression of the, rock, of, of the bone itself, rather. You're looking at an impression of the bone, but it's all made out of rock. So if you put it in acid, the whole thing's going to disappear. But Schweitzer did this procedure. She wanted to get a closer look at the fossil's fine structure and compare it with that of modern birds. That night, Wittenmeyer marveled at a small section of decalcified thigh bone. She said, when you wiggle it, it kind of wiggled it, it kind of floated in the breeze. It's kind of flexible. Schweitzer and Wittenmeyer pondered the meaning of the stretchy sample feeling mystified and ecstatic. 
The remains seem like soft tissue, specifically matrix, the organic part of bone, which consists primarily of collagen. That's connective tissue. Yet this seemed impossible according to the prevailing understanding. Next, Schweitzer examined a piece of the dinosaur's cortical bone. She says we struck the bone in the same kind stuck the bone rather in the same kind of solution. The bone mineral dissolved away and it left these transparent blood vessels. I took one look and I just said, uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, this isn't happening, this is just not happening. She started applying the same treatment to bone fragments from another dinosaur that she had acquired for her dissertation. Sure enough, she says, vessels all over the place. What you're looking at here is a magnified view of soft dinosaur tissue taken from a dinosaur bone. This strongly argues that dinosaur bones are not nearly as old as is claimed. Of course, evolutionists will not change their minds over this. They believe that somehow this material survived for millions of years because they are committed to their belief system. That's where they're at. Dr. David Minton, a creationist scientist with answers in Genesis, a young earth creationist scientist, uh, who died actually from COVID just last month, wrote in a 2012 article, Some evolutionists have strongly criticized Schweitzer's conclusions because they are understandably reluctant to concede the existence of blood vessels, cells with nuclei, tissue elasticity, and intact protein fragments in a dinosaur bone dated at 68 million years old. It just can't be. I didn't see it. I don't believe it. He goes on, other evolutionists who find Schweitzer's evidence too compelling to ignore simply conclude that there is some previously unrecognized form of fossilization that preserves cells and protein fragments over tens of millions of years. Needless to say, no evolutionist has publicly considered the possibility that dinosaur fossils are not millions of years old. You know, one might wonder if, since she attends an evangelical church, if if Dr. Schweitzer will ever change her views from evolution to creation. One never knows, of course, she could, but it really doesn't seem likely to happen. In that Discover article that I consulted for tonight's lesson, Mary Schweitzer says that creationists who contacted her hurt her more deeply then did fellow evolutionists. She said, these religious attacks wound her far more than the scientific ones. Here's what here's a quote from her. It rips my gut out, she says. These people are claiming to represent the Christ that I love. They're not doing a very good job. It's no wonder that a lot of my colleagues are atheists. She told one zealot, you know, the only picture of Christ I have was your attitude towards me, I'd run. Now, I don't know who of the creationist camp might have contacted Dr. Schweitzer. I find it difficult to imagine that all contact with creationists had been deeply hurtful to her. I also noticed that Dr. Schweitzer said something else in the article, which probably reflects her own attitude toward creationism. To Schweitzer, trying to prove your religious beliefs, please pay attention to the language here, religious beliefs through empirical evidence, science versus religion, okay? To try to prove your religious beliefs through empirical evidence is absurd, if not sacrilegious. If God is who he says he is, he doesn't need us to twist and contort scientific data, she says. The thing that's most important to God is our faith. Therefore, he's not going to allow himself to be proven by scientific methodologies. Mary Schweitzer obviously views the debate as one between, quote, religion and science, end quote. That's not the case at all. Anyone who ever studies the history of science will find out that Christians were the ones who started it. As I've demonstrated here before, the evolutionist camp, They have a belief system 
They have a prior commitment to a materialistic explanation for everything. And that's philosophical. That's not provable either. The chief spokesperson for this is Dr. Richard Lewinton. And I'll repeat his quote for you momentarily. I've used it before a couple times. Dr. Lewinton wrote these words in a foreword to Dr. Carl Sagan's book, The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. And Lewinton said this, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. Why? Because we have a prior commitment a commitment to materialism. Folks, materialism is a philosophical belief system. It's not science. He goes on to say, it's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. See, it's not that the science leads us to materialism, but on the contrary, he says, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes. The materialism comes first. We hold that first, and then we go and look for proof for that. He means prior assumptions that they make, things that they hold before they run their tests and draw their conclusions. He says, we're forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying, to the uninitiated, to the unconverted, to the ones who aren't part of the holy uh, uh, cabal of science and materialism that, that guides it. Moreover, he says, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. God is not welcome in science. He goes on, the eminent Kant scholar, Louis Beck, used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. Now, the late Dr. Lewinton, he died last year at the age of 92, was obviously an atheist. In fact, it said in the Wikipedia article that he was an atheist. Anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. That Lewis Beck quote, you know, folks, I've often said that evolutionism is a belief system designed by atheist thinking. All right, it's a, it's a way of trying to explain the existence of everything because you don't believe that there was a God who made it. Dr. Mary Schweitzer now is an evangelical who believes in God, yet maintains a commitment to evolution and is not above criticizing creationists. I have to wonder what Dr. Lewinton, who was an evolutionary biologist, I have to wonder what he thought, if he thought about it at all, about Mary Schweitzer's work of discovering this soft tissue in dinosaur fossils. As we read from, from Dr. Minton's quote a little bit ago, there was some evolutionary scientist who just dismissed it out of hand because it couldn't possibly be so. He may have been one of them here. I don't know. I had read that some evolutionists have thought that the dinosaur bones were somehow contaminated by soft tissue that got in there from another source other than the dinosaur bones because it just couldn't have soft tissue in them. Dr. Mary Schweitzer has wanted to succeed in this rigorous world of modern science that she's in. And I've heard that it's a tough field for women because they don't feel that they get respect from most of their male colleagues. And that's probably true. I also, therefore, find it telling 
that in the Discovery article, Mary Schweitzer also said this. That's the saddest part about doing science in America, she says. You are totally driven by what gets you funding. Totally driven by where how you get money. It is it is sad. She's absolutely right that money is what makes the world system go round. And it's also true in the sciences. you got to keep them happy, those who are paying your bills or those that you want to pay your bills and pay your expenses for you to do your research. You have to get your funding from somewhere and you can't look like a quack. The Bible has it right when it says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Dr. Minton will wrap it up for us here tonight, just reading his closing thoughts in his article on this. An obvious question arises from Schweitzer's work. Is it even remotely plausible that blood vessels, cells, and protein fragments can exist largely intact over 68 million years? The criticisms of some of these evolutionary scientists are absolutely right. This, this just can't be. Not for that long of a period of time. He goes on to say, while many consider such long-term preservation of tissue and cells to be very unlikely, the problem is that no human or animal remains are known with certainty to be 68 million years old. That's never been proven or demonstrated conclusively at all. Every dating system they have is filled with assumptions. But, he says, if creationists are right, dinosaurs died off only 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. So, would we expect the preservation of vessels, cells, and complex molecules of the type that Schweitzer reports for biological tissues historically known to be? 3,000 to 4,000 years old. In other words, do we have other examples from that long ago that have these same basic materials, the vessels, cells, and complex molecules? And he says, well, the answer is yes. Many studies of Egyptian mummies and other humans of this old age, confirmed by historical evidence, show all the sorts of detail Schweitzer reported in her T-Rex. In addition to Egyptian mummies, the Tyrolean Iceman, found in the Alps in 1991 and believed to be about 5,000 years old, shows such incredible preservation of DNA and other microscopic detail. And he says, finally, we conclude that the preservation of vessels, cells, and complex molecules in dinosaurs is entirely consistent with a young Earth creationist perspective, but is highly implausible with the evolutionist perspective about dinosaurs that died off millions of years ago. Well, I want to thank you folks for watching tonight, listening to this. I hope you, you see this in, in the, the way that I've been able to see it. I know it's the first time maybe you've uh, found out about this or heard about the idea of soft tissue being found in dinosaurs. I hope to explore this with you further next week because it actually gets kind of ridiculous because in a sense that uh, she finds this and it's like, whoa, what's going on here? And they've been looking at dinosaur bones for, uh, you know, at least 100 years or more up to that time, and nobody has seen anything like this before. They've smelled the smells, but they never really gave it much thought as to what caused those smells. Because, well, the tissue just couldn't be there, right? It just couldn't be there. So it can't possibly be that. It must be something else, some, some kind of gas or something that's left over from something or other, leached in, whatever. And it just smells like sulfur or dead, you know, rotten eggs or whatever. But now they find it's, she finds this soft tissue. Here's the thing. She's not the only one. We're going to look at some other examples of soft tissue being found, not only in dinosaurs, but in fossils that go back, supposedly, to half a billion years ago, to the time before the dinosaurs, supposedly, on their scale. And guess what? They find soft tissue in those fossils as well. It seems that all fossils have some of this false fo soft tissue inside of it. And it is false to claim that they are so ridiculously old. 
There's something wrong with this system that people all believe in. But there's a lot of money wrapped up in it. There's a lot dedicated to it. There's a big commitment to it. And it keeps God out of the picture. We can't allow a divine foot in the door. I tell you, this is a spiritual issue. It's not one about logic or reason or science or observation or anything like that. It's at the heart of the human being. It's a heart issue. What are we going to do with God? We know our hearts rebel against him and want nothing to do with him. And that's the explanation behind so much of this controversy. Thank you. You have a blessed night, and we'll see you soon. Talk to you soon. God bless.